Hello everyone, my name is Lydia Sebhat and I am the MC for the final section of the Systems Change Summit, Beyond the Great Reset. As a reminder, this summit is brought to you by Systems Change Alliance, which is a platform where individuals and organizations can discuss and offer solutions to economic, social, and environmental crises, recognizing that these challenges are interconnected and require systemic change. Our next speaker for today's summit is James Quilligan. James Quilligan has been an analysis, an analyst in the field of international economic development since 1975. From 1978 to 1984, he was a researcher and press secretary for the Independent Commission on International Development Issues, chaired by West German Chancellor Willy Brandt. Since then, Quilligan has served as an advisor and writer for leaders, governments, and economic institutions in more than 50 countries. He is presently Managing Director of Economic Democracy Advocates, which promotes equitable and sustainable resource management. James will be giving a talk on the global shift to distributive value. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to talk to the Systems Change Alliance about uh, a uh, an issue that's uh, extremely important. In fact, uh, some would say it's really vital to uh, the future. And that is the global shift to distributive value um, from supply side to need needs-based economies. Now, the reason this is so important is we're in a supply-side economy right now, and we don't necessarily identify it as such. We all know there are problems, but we don't necessarily know how to get to the next stage of evolution for the planet. Um, part of the reason is that individual and collective worldviews are um, at loggerheads right now. There's a polarity between individual and collective ideas. So the way this is uh, in balance right now is that the individual freedom to produce and use resources has become more important than the collective responsibility to protect resources and, and ensure their equitable distribution to everyone. This is a really fundamental issue. And the reason this imbalance has been created is that the total freedom to use resources is outweighing our minimal responsibility to protect resources. So essentially that's what's happening. It's an ideology about total freedom to use resources that is uh, minimizing our um, ability to uh, uh, protect resources for the collective interest. And the paradox is this, that today's economies only grow by getting people to consume beyond their needs. The problem though, is that stimulating the economic demand of our expanding populations is resulting in an overuse of the planet's fixed amount of non-renewable resources. And it's also resulting in our inability to replenish Earth's renewable resources at an adequate level. In addition to the fact that it's leading to our inability to meet the needs of all people. So um, one could easily say that this is a result of free market failure because economic growth is justifying using more resources and polluting more now and not meeting the needs of the people in future generations. So our descendants that we hope will be better off than we are, are actually going to be much worse off than we are. It's the contradiction of infinite growth in a finite world that is the fundamental issue. And it shows that there's a general unwillingness among most of humanity now to engage in realistic long-term societal planning. 
so there are a lot of issues involved here, but one of the main things to focus on is why are we valuing goods in the future much, much less than we're valuing goods today? Uh, there are various reasons that people have put forward why this is the case, that we may become ill or die and not be able to find as much value in future goods, uh, or we prefer to focus on today rather than tomorrow. Other people say we like to spend now rather than save for the future. Uh, all of these go into the realm of a deeper principle, which is called discounting the future. It's a term used in economics. The uh, discounting process converts units of value across time horizons. So it translates future dollars into today's dollars. It estimates future value more cheaply and shifts the costs of poverty and ecological degradation to later generations. This is an active principle. It's an algorithm that's behind our modern economy. The, in, in effect, what, what this means is that to make money today, values in the distant future are given a present value that is close to nothing. So virtually we're betting against the environment and our grandchildren. And again, why do we justify discounting future costs and benefits through our present system of value? We're impatient, the future is far away. Most people don't like risk. Investors want to profit and banks offer them the opportunity to do that through interest rates. So the algorithms of economic growth, we, we often say, you know, the problem is that uh, Exponential economic growth is running rampant. What can we do? Well, the fact is that it's more than just um, recognizing the problem. It's actually identifying it to the extent that we can get, get in and change it. Because what happens is uh, when we look into it, we're realizing that we need a new accounting system because the present system is not accounting for the costs of uh, loss of non-renewable resources, environmental services, and human life. The main mechanism in our collective decision-making is interest rates rather than sustainability rates. That's what's driving the system. The interest rates, uh, an interesting um, proposition, if you look at it closely, it's the amount um, paid or received uh, over a period of time uh, compared with the principal sum that uh, is borrowed or is lent out to people. So the interest rate expresses the relationship between lenders, borrowers, and the money supply. But the fact is, whether you understand what the interest rate is or not, interest rates don't reflect the rate at which nature regenerates. And that's the key point. It's why money is being produced faster than nature can create real wealth. And so this requires a quick uh, overview of the meaning of supply and demand. So today we're sort of familiar with uh, a, uh, a uh, ideological dispersion between conservative and, and uh, liberal governments and also uh, libertarian governments, which are a little further to the right than the conservatives. So in effect, each of those uh, polarities, both the libertarian conservative side and the liberal side have adopted their own economic premises. And the conservative side has said that supply side economics is the best. It's based on the individual, smaller government, lower taxes, lower spending, they're pro-business. And the demand side is, is, has been represented uh, throughout the 20th century on, um, uh, by the liberal governments uh, through economic demand. And they're generally um, in favor of collectivism rather than individualism. So that's the broad look at it politically. And supply and demand is uh, actually, in a way, if you think about it, it's the supply of resources from nature that can be measured according to the resource thresholds of, of uh, 
uh, of the supply. And then also uh, the demand from nature, which it can be measured in terms of population allocations. So the market value that we're tracking today is an inexact approximation of this relationship. And uh, some really revelatory things happened in the 1930s. John Maynard Keynes recognized uh, this principle that as price inflation goes up, unemployment goes down. As unemployment goes up, price inflation goes down. And that was a, a really profound insight. And it became the basis of the New Deal in the United States and Keynesian policies across the world. Essentially, the idea was that to adjust unemployment through go government stimulus of labor, then uh, you could actually uh, readjust the economy. You could fine tune it. Uh, Keynes was a little bit it politically a little bit left of center. Uh, another person named Robert Phillips came along in the 1950s and he showed the same thing in terms of wage inflation that Keynes had recognized. He said that as wage inflation went up, unemployment went down. As wage inflation went down, unemployment went up. And that you could ingest inflation through interest rates. This was a revelation to the economic world because macroeconomics had been invented and it really worked very well throughout the 1940s and 50s and 60s until it didn't. Then we had a series of monetary system failures. In the 1970s and 80s, high inflation and high unemployment existed at the same time. Keynes and Phillips said that was impossible, that couldn't happen. In the 2010s, we've had low inflation and low unemployment. And again, um, Keynes and Phillips said that was impossible. So what's, what this leads to is that we're in a major dilemma today because the future of the economic system and the monetary system is in doubt. And a lot of people behind the scenes are um, uh, trying to figure this out and trying to understand what the next level of development is for the economy. So Keynes and Phillips were on the right track with looking at the relationship between inflation and unemployment, but for reasons that they didn't necessarily understand because inflation is indirectly tied to resource thresholds, meaning that how nature supplies resources and unemployment is indirectly in, uh, in direct uh, related to population allocations. Now, what's the, the, uh, the crux of the crisis right now is that central banks can no longer adjust inflation through interest rates. As most of you know, interest rates are at an all time low and it's been very difficult to raise interest rates because of the fear of inflation. Uh, but it's a broader problem than that because what they've, they've come up with is a recognition that the old macroeconomic system isn't really working. So the question is that we should not be targeting inflation through interest rates anymore. We should be adjusting economic growth to its real value, including the degradation of the environment, or the declines that we're seeing across the world in non-renewable resources and society's incapacity to meet the needs of all people in the future. So a lot of you have heard of entropy, a second law of thermodynamics. And this principle is active in the world. We're draining uh, energy from our ecosystems. And we see this through the depletion of forests, the collapsed fisheries that are in the oceans, you know, our eroded soils. And at the same time, we're dumping waste back into our ecosystems. Uh, through um, massive um, uh, waste and including plastics and uh, carbon dioxide and chemical uh, toxins that are uh, going back into our environment. We're doing all that without returning a net energy gain to the environment. What does that mean exactly? Essentially, we're extracting negative net energy resources so that our economic debt has to be continuously repaid by borrowing from nature. And we're rationalizing that it never has to be repaid. According to the economic system, 
you can continue to borrow and um, and uh, spend forever and ever, and it won't affect the environment. So without a recognized feedback loop between money and ecology, market value is essentially a measure of how indebted human beings are to the natural world. We're using up resource equity without restoring it. So um, supply side economics was defined by John Maynard Keynes as the principle that supply creates its own demand. What it means essentially is Production is more important than distribution. Uh, but supply side economics does not measure the distributive value of meeting the basic needs of all people, which is extremely important. Supply side economics looks at the um, natural resource prices in terms of their commodity value. And uh, the uh, and of course, the 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 pr those prices are uh, are put on commodities that uh, people use and buy through the marketplace. So what's what what's behind supply side economics is the principle of value added. We're adding value at every level of the economic supply chain, from the extraction of resources from nature through their production into goods and commodities, uh, through the commerce. Uh, in which the, those resources are sold and through investment in the process to the distribution of the resources to their consumption and to their waste. There's value added at every step of that process. And we take it for granted because that's the way uh, the modern economy works. But that's exactly what the problem is, that resource thresholds and populations are a much broader macroeconomic picture because they involve ecology, but it's not being honored in our value added system because value added does not express the rate at which nature regenerates. So the point is, isn't our goal to supply human need and not human demand? Because demand is measured in cash, which is a specific and universal form of value but need is mainly expressed in physiological terms. Need therefore requires more of a biophysical form of measure, a different kind of accounting system so that the satisfaction of human need can be quantified on a mass scale. If we think about it, there's a kind of uh, interesting uh, dialectic involved here. On the one hand, the proponents of supply side economics say produce it and people will buy the goods. On the other hand, the people on the political right have said since Keynes, raise people's wages and then they'll buy the goods. And finally, uh, what, what is emerging is a different kind of idea, which is supply the resource to people because they need it, which is the essence of distribution. Now this isn't redistribution, this is actually distributed distributive value goes directly to people. Redistribution is a political idea that um, money is collected by uh, a government system or um, some kind of uh, account, and then it's redistributed to people. The idea here is that supply to people happens directly. So now we're talking about a supply and demand kind of economy that is directly involved in the balance between resource thresholds and population allocations as it exists in an ecosystem where you have resources that are available to meet the needs of a population within a particular region. That's how the accounting system needs to work. We're, instead of the value added, we're gonna need to measure the value renewed. Conserving non-renewable resources and replenishing renewable resources is the essence of value renewed. It means that we can now attain future well-being and intergenerational equity by focusing on two things, uh, the sustainability of our resources and the um, equality that's expressed in trading uh, resources today, as well as in the future years. It requires us to, 
to balance the material supply and need of people now with the material supply and need of people in years to come. So the global shift to distributive value is both um, uh, expressed in, in different ways through marginal utility theory, which is the essence of neoclassical economics. That's what we have today. We, we call it also neoliberalism now. Uh, and it's also expressed through progressive utilization theory, which some of you are familiar with. Marginal utility theory talks about individual increases in satisfaction of human consumption. Progressive utilization theory talks about collective increases in satisfaction of human need. Uh, now, in, in terms of progressive utilization theory, the problem with it is it does not indicate how this is going to be measured. It indicates the um, what a world would look like in which this principle is enacted, but it doesn't give us a metric system for being able to understand it. And that's why societies now are currently using market prices exclusively to evaluate the distribution of resources for individuals to meet their basic needs. So back to the principle of discounting the future. Remember, the discounting process converts units of value across time horizons. It translates future dollars into today's dollars. And think about it, if we were to slow the rate of discount to 0% a year, we would have a chart that looks like it does on the right, where we would stay within the carrying capacity of our environment rather than the exponential growth that you see on the chart on the left. We could slow resource extraction and waste according to their rates of replenishment and adjust food, water, and energy needs to the size of the population that needs them. So uh, the group that I'm representing is Economic Democracy Advocates, and we are studying carrying capacity in bioregions in um, all over the United States. So um, we're really looking at the uh, potential resources in an area uh, measured um, or compared with the needs of the population in an area. Now, this looks like a simple formula. In fact, to, to be able to compute this is, is much more difficult than what you see here, but that is basically the relationship, the potential resources of a region and the needs of the population in that region. And this is useful to land planners and policymakers, regenerative communities, uh, basic citizens uh, are, are find value in this, in understanding uh, legislation and advocacy measures that can be used to, to attain greater interest in carrying capacity to determine their bioregion self-sufficiency. But I would also add that it's also uh, of interest to people who are creating cryptocurrencies and other forms of value uh, that, are, um, that are pointing toward a new accounting system because uh, a cryptocurrency based on a bioregion is something that people have not understood yet completely. Uh, economic democracy advocates is also looking at distributive value, which is um, comparing what we had just spoken about, the carrying capacity with the actual resource distribution within a region. Now, combining those two things uh, uh, shows us the distributive value, which essentially is a comparison of the carrying uh, of the capacity of a region's resources to meet the needs of its population, comparing that with the amount of resources that are actually reaching each person. So this takes us from the realm of managing our commons from something that's a good idea and self-evident to us to something we can actually measure. So we're moving in a sense from metaphor to metrics in order to stop betting against the environment and future generations. We, in order to do that, we're going to have to measure the commons through carrying capacity and distributive value. That's what will take us from supply side economics to need-based economies. Uh, if you think about it, uh, the, the metaphor is within the right brain or intuitive side that we know that there is an ideal out there that we can accomplish by having um, our economics follow the principles of living systems, building the, the same metrics of build, uh, living systems and the same principles of living systems within our economy. But those metrics also uh, appeal to our ability to 
measure them so that we get it right and we can um, we can measure what we treasure. So finally, um, if we review the last 500 years in a nutshell of where we've come from, we can see a, an upward arc, which now it seems like it's going into a long period of decline. And over the last 500 years, we have watched the development of colonialism and capitalism. Uh, extreme economic growth based on the idea that uh, uh, resources are infinite and very short term uh, time horizons in which we don't worry very much about the future. So within that ethic, resource supply was uh, stimulating consumer demand. And that seemed to be the, the, the driving force that society needed to move forward. Now we're into a new system. The next 500 years uh, during which we're gonna experience more and more climate change, we're gonna need more commons cooperatives, meaning that economic sustainability needs to come to the forefront. We're gonna to have to have much longer uh, term high, uh, time horizons. And this is a system in which human need stimulates resource supply. So, that's uh, that's just a, a basic outline of how we're going to accomplish this global shift from um, supply side economics to uh, needs based economies, and uh, along with that, a uh, shift for from um, the economic system of uh, exponential growth to one more of distributive value, so that uh, the people's needs are met. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, James. That was a very informative talk. Um, we are now moving into the Q&A section of the program. So if you have any questions to ask James, please put them in the chat and we will have about 10 minutes for him to answer your questions. So our first question for the Q&A is, you said we need to supply need, not demand. How will the economy determine what are real needs, not unreasonable or artificial demands? Good question. Um, by measuring our carrying capacity and computing distributive value. And uh, I kind of outlined how that, that works, but I'll, I'll go into it in a little more depth here. Um, at the moment, we're not measuring carrying capacity of our regions, partly because there's no money in it. Um, there's no market for that, but we have to make a market for that. In other words, uh, we have to take it seriously. It's a principle that has been around for a long, long time, but people have actually never um, incorporated that into large scale economic planning. And the second thing is that the, uh, the emphasis on distributive value has been long talked about in, um, in the areas of economic justice, uh, but it, it has never gotten teeth because it, it, it's never been measured. So what we do right now is we me measure distribution by the amount of um, uh, goods are, that are being uh, consumed by people. And that's, that's where we leave it. We, we talk about the, uh, the price at the, at the uh, price of the cash register, uh, and that's where we leave off demand. We, we say that's, that's the proxy for meeting human needs. Well, um, it doesn't even begin to measure human needs. So, uh, so that means that there has to be a much more complex system now developed to actually measure people's basic human needs. And, uh, and again, there, the reason that's not being developed is there's no money in it. Right, people are not investing in actually making this happen, but it's going to have to happen, regardless of whether people are gonna make money off of doing this, it has to happen. Thank you for that answer. Um, our next question is, can carrying capacity change with changes in technology? Nature seems more of a stable system than human culture. So how to deal with that unique dynamic? 
Well, it's interesting. Carrying capacity is not a stable system because when we go out and measure carrying capacity, some areas are below their carrying capacity, some are above. And the reason why you measure carrying capacity is to help to uh, stabilize the system. Have to, and and uh, uh, so technology can be an aid in doing that if it's used properly. But right now, uh, technology is mostly uh, contributing to value added. And so it's not um, it's not working uh, to to create value renewed, but um, but technologies it can be seen as part of the problem, but it, it is actually possibly part of the solution if the ownership of technology and the use of technology were to change in the toward uh, public interest. Thank you. Our next question is. Do we need an entirely new economic system or can we simply reform capitalism using the ideas you've just presented? I don't think it can be reformed. I think it has to be restructured. And that's one of the reasons why I support Systems Change Alliance because um, the folks here mostly have that figured out. Uh, no, the, the reforms, our, our time of reform is done. We can't, um, th there's too much at stake now to, to go down that rabbit hole again. We, we need to get really serious in, about transforming our system. Thank you. Our next question is, you mentioned bioregional cryptocurrency. Could you elaborate on what you see as the key characteristics of such a regional currency? Yeah, sure. Uh, we, we're measuring something really interesting, which is the, uh, the carrying capacity of different bioregions. And it's unlike anything you see in market value, which is one of the reasons we're doing it, but it's not the only reason. We're trying to understand the, the balance within different ecosystems, which can be, um, as I said earlier, it could be changed by uh, uh, policy solutions, technological applications, different things can be used to, to change that level between um, the, the, uh, the dyna dynamics in the ecosystem. And so what are those dynamics? And I, I mentioned this before, but I probably didn't stress it enough. It's the resources that are available within a region that meet the needs of the organisms within that region. So that broadly speaking, that applies to ecosystems, but in this case, the organisms are human beings and that's what we're measuring. So uh, it's doable to, to look at that. And then how does that, how does that work with a possible cryptocurrency. Well, the way most cryptocurrencies are set up right now, they have some kind of tie with the market value, whether it's upfront tie or on the back end. In some place or another, it the, the cryptocurrency that's being uh, generated is either an investment scheme or it's um, the value of the currency is related to commodity value of some particular good. And what I'm suggesting is that that's a flawed accounting system and it won't lead to the proper use of blockchain. But with current capacity as a driver, um, it's a whole different thing because now we're not, we're expressly not measuring anything in market value. We're tying it to the ecosystem value that is part of every ecosystem. You know, Howard Odom, the ecologist once said that um, there's no ecology that's actually in debt. So um, we, we can measure what we might call ecological debt in the world and it's, it's voluminous, it's huge and it's growing all the time. But, but our concept of debt is still based in our economic um, understanding. And it's true that there is no debt in nature. And so that's the mindset that we develop when we're thinking about value renewed because now we're not talking about value added, which in effect means the value we're subtracting from ecology. And now we're talking about what, how do we live as a society by um, structuring our economic system to renew value in all of our transactions. So we, we definitely need to um, live off of food, of water and energy to meet our basic needs uh, and yet, at the same time, um, how are how are our, all those transactions that lead up to that 
expressed in a way that uh, renews value. With a cryptocurrency based on carrying capacity, uh, you would be able to um, actually make that system become more present by spending in the in the cryptocurrency because you're instead of waiting for prices to shift to send you the 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 the, um, the signals like like signals at the gas pump if if um, gasoline goes up in value you stop buying it so that we're we're waiting for the price signal to in in uh, give us the the signals in this case uh, cryptocurrencies based on bioregional value would actually be uh, showing us the um, the way we can make adjustments in our ecology by listening to the signals that are coming through our money, not through the prices that uh, that we're paying for things. It's a big difference, it's a big shift. Thank you for that explanation. Um, I think this might be our last question that we take. It says, would you share your experience with watershed in California as an example of measuring carrying capacity? Yeah, uh, uh, San Francisco Bay watershed is very interesting because um, we uh, it, it famously has the district of um, San Francisco within it, the, the, and um, which is high density population, very little agriculture, uh, needs to import all of its food and water from outside the region, um, and meaning that it's 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 well above its carrying capacity. Two outlying areas that. Um, are within the Central Valley of California, which is still well under its carrying capacity. So within one bioregion, you have all these extremes. And uh, one of the experiences that we had from doing that research was to really see very carefully that um, the different political districts within that bioregion have completely different views of how to manage that ecosystem. And the, the uh, as long as the people in San Francisco are willing to import uh, food from out and food and water and energy from outside the region, and the people from the Central Valley are willing to, you know, supply the um, water and and food into San Francisco, then um, there's a kind of tenuous agreement based on the marketplace. But what happens in a in a time of climate change? And we're already seeing signs in San Francisco of a mass exodus of people from the region. It, it will get worse because, because what you're seeing now is uh, the, of, of all these so-called climate refugees who are leaving San Francisco, it is because San Francisco is so far above its carrying capacity that it's literally driving people out. Well, thank you, James. That actually wraps up our Q&A with James Quilligan. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question and thank you again, James, for being with us today. Thank you. Yeah. If you're interested in learning more about systemic solutions to today's problems, please join our movement by following us on social media at Systems Change Alliance and check out our website, systemschangealliance.org to receive news, updates, and hear about upcoming events. Our next event is Systems Change Through Local Economies taking place online in September. So if you're interested in joining us, please check out our website to learn more.